crimes used to be a lot easier to get away with. Prior to 1987, when DNA profiling was first used to get a criminal conviction, it would seem that as long as you weren't caught in the act, and didn't explicitly tell anyone you planned to commit the crime, you could get away scot-free. It didn't matter if you'd left the weapon at the scene of the crime, gotten a number of injuries in the struggle, or had been covered head to toe in the victim's DNA. As long as no one saw you do it, you could live the rest of your life as a free person. Men and women used to be charged, tried, and imprisoned on hunches, or because they seemed like the type of guy who would kill someone, rather than any kind of direct evidence. Motive could be whatever the police said it was, whether that be they were jealous of a new promotion the person got, or if they wore all black most of the time. If someone new moved into the town the day before a murder, they could be charged on that alone, even if they had an airtight alibi. But through the use of DNA evidence and forensic science, the rate of patently false convictions went down. If one wanted to commit a murder, they would have to go through lengths to not be caught. Movies and television shows would depict a killer planning the perfect crime so as to not be caught, wearing gloves so they wouldn't leave any fingerprints, taking their victim by surprise so their DNA isn't found under the person's fingernails, and making sure that nothing left at the scene could be tied back to them. As long as they were careful and they kept their distance while committing their murder, they could potentially get away scot-free. Today, thousands of cold cases are being solved through testing DNA evidence, and the case we will be covering today is one of those times. Welcome back to another episode of Dreading, or if this is your first time here, welcome. Today, we will be covering the recently solved cold case of Robin Cornell and Lisa Story. This case came to us via a Patreon request, and after watching some of the material we will be looking over today, I understand why. This case does involve the murder of a child, and researching this case was extremely mentally taxing. As such, I want to urge that anyone who is sensitive to cases involving children to click off the video. Cases like this can be traumatizing, and though I don't go into graphic detail, it's important you put your mental health and well-being before anything else. As always, if there is a case you're interested in going over on this channel, feel free to let us know in the comments down below, or email us at treading.official at gmail.com. We are constantly adding new cases to our backlog, and responding to emails and corresponding with those involved. So if there is a case you feel we should pay more attention to, let us know. This video was brought to you by Scentbird. Did you know that scent is the most powerful sense to trigger a memory? According to brain scans, different fragrances trigger strong memories because of the brain regions that process them. Going out into a freshly mowed field reminds me of working on the farm with my dad and grandfather. Certain perfumes remind me of my mom and sister, and if I smell certain scents, I'm immediately transported back to when I was younger. But in today's modern age, it's harder to find a signature scent that people can attach to you. Or at least it was, prior to Scentbird. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that lets you choose a new designer fragrance to try every month for just $17. Which is a steal, given that a lot of luxury fragrances start at at least $50 for a travel size. Every month, you get to pick what you want to receive so there are no surprises. They have over 600 perfumes and colognes, and a lot of unisex options. They carry brands like Gucci, Prada, and Versace, as well as indie labels like Skylar, Hectic, and Confessions of a Rebel. This month, Scentbird sent me Oh So Vert, Luzi Patchouli, which my brother really likes. It's incredibly earthy and different, with a surprising amount of citrus in it. It manages to be both clean and musky at the same time, which I've never really experienced. They also sent me Cross River Gorilla by Sanctuary, which I've been wearing all month and plan to repurchase. I would have never picked up the scent on my own, but it's really earthly as well and cool. It's a lot of natural, woody smells mixed with leather. If you're interested in trying Scentbird risk-free and finding your new signature scent, use coupon code DREADING for 55% off at Scentbird, which is just a little over $7 for your first month. Again, that's code DREADING for 55% off in both US and Canada. Thank you again to Scentbird for continuing to sponsor my content, and thank you to all of you who make sponsorships like this possible. Now, let us begin. Robin Cornell was a typical 11-year-old. She was excited about everything, and every day, she had new dreams that she wanted to pursue. She would tell her mom, Jan, and her babysitter, Lisa Story, about her dreams, and how one day she was going to be a lawyer, or a doctor, or an actress. And every day, they would tell her they knew she was going to do it all. Robin was extremely well-loved in her community. According to the parents of Robin's classmates, she was the type of child who talked to everyone. It didn't matter if someone was considered weird or unpopular, she would make sure no one was left out. 
But unfortunately, on May 9, 1990, her young life and all of her dreams would come to a tragic end. That day, Jan and Robin helped Lisa move into their shared home. Lisa had worked as a babysitter for Robin for a short while and had gotten close to the family. She was an international student who loved photography and motorcycles, and when she needed a new place to stay, it only made sense for her to move in with a single mother and her daughter. That way she could be there whenever Robin needed looking after. According to people around the small group of women, they all loved each other, and Lisa had become an aunt to the 11-year-old. They celebrated the move over dinner before Robin turned in for the night, exhausted by the day's events. As Lisa and Jan cleaned up the home, Trying to sort through all of their things, Jan got a call from her boyfriend, asking if she wanted to go over and watch some television with him. Initially, Jan said no. She had had a long day and was as exhausted as her daughter was. But Lisa encouraged her to go out and have some fun with her boyfriend. Lisa reminded her that the whole point of her moving into the home was to provide her with around-the-clock child care, and she didn't mind taking care of Robin for the night. After a little bit of encouraging, Jan decided to go telling Lisa she would be back within a few hours. She went into her daughter's room, kissed her on the head, and said, Good night. I'm going to Donnie's. I love you. And that, unfortunately, was the last thing she would ever say to her daughter. After Jan had left Robin and Lisa, a person had entered the town home through the sliding glass back door and quickly surveyed the home. First, they found Lisa's story in the room she had just moved into and quickly subdued her. Lisa fought back against the attacker, grabbing a fistful of his hair and clawing them the best she could. But after a short struggle, she was suffocated on her bed with one of her own pillows. The attack was loud and woke up the 11-year-old. Not knowing what was happening and not believing she was in danger in her own home, she got up to see what was happening. But once the intruder saw the young girl, he quickly assaulted her as well, hitting her multiple times in the face before she was knocked out. He then suffocated her as well. After killing both Lisa and Robin, he sexually violated them, leaving DNA in and on their bodies, as well as their bedsheets. He left their bodies in disturbing positions, with the desire to humiliate them in their death and traumatize whoever was to find the bodies. Following the murder and post-mortem sexual assaults, the killer appeared to have taken a shower, seemingly unconcerned with the idea of being discovered. Shortly thereafter, they left the scene, unknowingly leaving their car keys in the kitchen of the home. The next morning, Jan woke up at 4 a.m., still at her boyfriend's house. She had accidentally fallen asleep on his couch and realized her mistake. She flew into a panic, both because she had not returned home like she said she would and because she had to start work at 4.30 in the morning. Her boyfriend's home was only a few blocks away from her own, but she knew she was going to be late. She rushed home, but immediately knew something was wrong as she couldn't get into the door. The door had two locks, a deadbolt, which worked, and another in the doorknob, which did not but one key was supposed to open both. Everyone who had come to her home knew better than to lock the doorknob, and she knew Lisa would have never done so. Once more, she began to panic. She quickly rushed to the back of the home that she shared with her daughter and the babysitter, and found the sliding glass door completely open, with the blinds blowing in and out. She yelled out for Lisa and Robin, hoping they were playing a prank on her, or that Lisa might have gotten drunk and left the house in disarray, but no one answered. The home itself was freezing, as the back door had been open with the air conditioning put on full blast. Jan hurried through the house, and was horrified to find Lisa and Robin dead on their beds. When Jan found her daughter deceased in her own bed, she quickly fought to save her life. She moved Robin to the ground and began to do CPR, hoping that she would be able to bring her back from the dead. But it was too late. Both Robin and Lisa were beyond saving. Multiple neighbors heard the commotion and called the police, and were traumatized by what they found. The details of the case were horrific, and the fact that such a brutality had been done to a girl who was only 11 years old, who asked her mom in the days leading up to her death if she was old enough to have her first kiss, made many officers sick. Many who looked at the case stated without a shadow of a doubt that it would be solved quickly. Whoever had taken Robin and Lisa's lives had left a plethora of evidence. They had left their DNA everywhere and had seemingly forgotten their car keys. But that was not the case. Police canvassed the area, obtained hundreds of DNA samples, and followed up on every lead that they could, but nothing came of it. Jan spoke to the police frequently, trying to keep her daughter and friend's case at the top of their minds, but it had stalled, and people had moved on. She reached out for help from different groups and former police officers, hoping that they could provide answers, but they too came up short. The story was featured on television shows like America's Most Wanted in the hopes that continued publicity would lead to a break in the case, but the case would remain cold until 26 years later. 
Joseph Zeiler was in Lee County Jail on a felony aggravated battery charge for shooting his son with a pellet gun in August of 2016 when his DNA was placed into the criminal database. Zeiler had not been connected to the case and had never met Robin or Lisa prior to the murders. However, once his DNA was added to the criminal database, it showed that it was a match for the DNA that was found in and on both Lisa and Robin. He had conclusively been shown to have been the person to kill both Lisa and Robin. However, he denied any wrongdoing. He stated that he had never met Lisa or Robin, and that there was no way that it was his DNA at the crime scene. He claimed that the DNA that they found was likely his uncle, his brother, or his father, and that it had been them that committed the crime, as they lived less than five miles away from the murder, which would also put him close to the murder at the time. He would then change his story, stating that it was possible for the DNA found at the scene to have belonged to him, only because he had slept with someone at that location before, and that Jan, Robin, and Lisa had never cleaned their sheets. At times, he would state that he had sex with Jan while on vacation once, and that he had simply left so much DNA during their sexual escapades that it was still showing up years later. He also routinely stated that the DNA that was found at the scene couldn't possibly match him as the hair that was found gripped in Robin's fist was blonde, and he was brunette. But to be clear, there was never any record of the hair being blonde. His story made no sense, and it was clear to anyone who saw the facts of the case that he was guilty, and many believed he would eventually admit to his guilt prior to the trial. The evidence was overwhelming. However, he refused to, instead pleading not guilty in court. It's unclear that he sincerely believed that he could beat the conviction, but it's unlikely that is what he wanted. He had gotten away with murder for two decades, and he wanted to continue to have control over his life, especially if that meant re-traumatizing all of those who had been involved in the case. On June 8, 2022, while awaiting trial, Joseph would write a letter to the judge in his case. The following is that letter. Honorable Robert Branning. I have a fair offer to avoid bringing this to jury trial. If you order full retesting of all exhibits, with NB32 prefix, and any of them test to contain either victim's epithelial profile, I will waive a jury trial and allow you to personally impose sentencing. However, you must agree to drop all charges if my DNA genotype is mixed with, as I have said from the beginning, either redacted or redacted partial profile, because if either redact are in any NB32 exhibit, there is no way possible it could originate from the night of the crime. You know this. Pausing for just a moment, but the DNA that they matched with Joseph was not old DNA. It wasn't found on the bedsheets from years earlier. His hair was found clutched in Lisa's hand and in her mouth. So his argument that while she was being killed by another person who left no DNA in the home, she grabbed hold of a random patch of his hair that had been left on her bed for years prior. That makes no sense and is clearly false. But continuing with the letter. To include zero in an independent lab not affiliated with FDLE. NB32A1 plus 2 NB3261 underscore 2 NB32E and all things connected. This of course must also test and verify my actual genotype. If my genotype is neither 1.1.1.2 or 1.2.1.2, you let me go. I am a man of my word and I will give you my word if my genotype DNA is in any way mixed with either victim, redacted. I will waive a jury trial. Put me to death. I give you my assurance. I am in no way connected to either victim. The only exhibit allegedly tying me to this crime is NB32A, which I contest is geno reading of 1.2 Point one point two, because any DNA expert will tell you a mix of four people rarely yields an uncontestable genotype identifying one single individual. Excuse me if I doubt my genotype is either the genotypes quoted in this case. I do not believe myself to be either 1.1.1.2 or 1.2.1.2. CCPD is hiding information. You cannot contest. Retesting of SV1K has ruined the state's capital rape case. No discernible geno reading means no scientific foundation. The second rape charge had zero foundation from the very start because no amplifiable DNA was present. You have no case for rape. And lastly, the very light blonde hair in Redacted's mouth and stuck to both bodies and found on both transport sheets, very light blonde is found in 2% of the population worldwide, pretty much points to another person as I have very dark brown hair. Again, pausing for just a moment to say that the hairs that were found at the scene were brown. When the evidence was collected and logged, it was logged as brown hair. 
when it was discussed in police documents and records, it was described as being brown. Joseph saying the DNA was blonde is just false. But back to the letter. Dark brown haired individuals don't leave dozens of blonde hairs behind. I am innocent. There's no way to contest a non-matching genotype, fingerprints, hair color, and a mix of either adult female redacted mixed with my DNA. Your Honor, read Discovery, especially Mary Legrand's interview. Redacted can in no way remember the number of men quoted throughout Discovery. They're both senile. And even gamble, if I'm in any way mixed with either victim, I welcome your best, no trial. If I prove my honesty, you let me go. Being young, on vacation, sleeping with divorced, willing, consensual older women is in no way a crime. Dementia can't excuse genotype reports. Even odds say it can go either way. Respectfully maintaining my innocence, Jay Zeeler. And do you really want this returned to your courtroom? I will not plead to a crime I had no part in. Freeing me is no gift, homeless and penniless at 60. I will leave Florida within 24 hours after reviewing my chronic care medication and disability. Also, sir, did you know my father is a disgraced pedophile, Cape Coral, third in command, Cape Coral police shift commander, supervisor, along with his brother from Punta Gorda, both with pregnant 12-year-old girls on public records, and Cape Coral, both on probation in 1990, and were never looked at by CCPD, even though they lived within five miles the night the crime happened? This is why they're hiding this. This is why CCPD wants to close this on the hush-hush quiet down low. They absolutely have the wrong person and have had the pedophile who caused this on probation employed by them underneath their noses for 30 years. And now, after charging me by jumping the gun on lineal, they know they face public humiliation if they reveal the perpetrator of this crime was one of their own. And they've ignored the lineal for six years to avoid embarrassing themselves. Think I'm lying? Check. Mr. Feinberg is aware. I will provide all family history plus info. It's someone in my family, brothers, uncle, or father. All right, so that is that. This is similar to Dustin McFetridge writing the judge in his case and promising that he is innocent and should be allowed to just leave prison. Joseph believes that he should just tell the judge he is innocent and all the evidence against him is fabricated, and then he'll be allowed to leave. He is a man of his word after all. The DNA would be retested by another lab prior to the trial, and once more, the DNA was found to be an exact match to Zeeler. Moreover, his allegations against his family held no weight, as their DNA had been in the system for longer than Zeeler's, and was not a match to what was found at the scene. The case would eventually go to trial in May of 2023, and Zeeler's defense had an extremely hard time contesting the facts of the case. They were forced to fight that despite Zeeler's DNA match, he had not been the murderer. They tried to argue that the hair had been blonde, not brunette, and that the murder had been done to ruin Jan's life. They argued that Jan was leading a double life, and that her shady actions had led to her daughter's and friend's death, but they showed no evidence of this. Joseph would eventually take the stand in his own defense, and it would go horrifically. Whenever we cover cases where a person takes the stand in their own defense, we discuss what they would need to do in order to convince a jury. Usually, their goal is to seem as meek and docile as possible, making it impossible to imagine them hurting anyone. They want to seem innocent, kind, and fragile, with the hopes that their actions will speak louder than the evidence. But in this case, that is not true. There is so much conclusive evidence that Zeeler is the one who killed Robin and Lisa that there is no arguing that he is innocent. So, let's see what he does. Mr. Shirley, your witness. Thank you, Your Honor. Please tell the jury your name. Joseph Adam Zeiler. Are you the defendant in this, in this case? Yes. May I approach? Approach. Mr. Zeiler, let me show you what's been previously identified as our exhibit A. Can you tell me what that exhibit is? There's a picture of me and my son who's clutching my back and my um, cousin, one of two twins, um, Danny. How old are you in that picture? 26. What color hair do you have in that picture? Hold on, let me think about that. How old I was, sorry. In less than a minute on the stand, Joseph has already made himself appear untrustworthy and guilty. This testimony would take place on day three of the trial. 
after the jury had been made aware of all the evidence. Joseph's demeanor, posture, and inability to answer the question correctly the first time would confirm his guilt to the jury. Moreover, this is his attorney. He would have been prepped on how to respond to this question, and the fact that he is unsure says a lot. I guess I was, I'll say 26. I have a problem with, with dates. Um, what color was your hair? Uh, same color. I was born with very, very dark brown. Okay, have you always had that color hair? Yes, sir. Let me show you what's been uh, previously identified as our exhibit B. Can you, do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. Is that a photograph? Yes. Do you recognize the person in the photograph? Yes. Who is that? That's my older brother, um, Robert Joseph Zeiler, who I was raised with, but I believe he's my half-brother. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. I'd, I'd like to have these admitted in evidence, please. No objection. Yeah. Defense, Defense Publishing a. to the jury. Hold on. <clears throat> Defense A and B are admitted. You may publish. Thank you. Rather than pass in office, I'd like to look at them. These two men both have brown hair. Do you have any other brothers? Yes, I have a brother, um, Steve. He was five years older than me, but he <clears throat> he died, I believe, about 2008. And uh, obviously you have a father. Well, um, <clears throat> I really don't know who my father is because of course I was born with very dark brown hair and my brothers were born with light sandy hair and my mother kept that secret um, I guess for her own safety. Okay. Back in 1990 when this event occurred, uh, where did your brothers reside? Well, both my brothers were here in December of 89. All right, stop. Where's here? In Florida. Okay, where in Florida? Oh, Cape Coral. Okay, did they did they live in Cape Coral? Yes, they were, they were working on the Cape Coral Hospital as block, a block mason and laborer. Okay, and uh, was your father, or the person that may be your father, was he living down here then? Yes. Where was he working? I believe he wasn't working. He was living on a houseboat in Marina Town, but I believe he was retired from working. From where? Well, he didn't leave voluntarily. He was arrested in Cape Coral driving the Cape Coral squad car. Was he a member of the Cape Coral Police Department? Yes, sir. He was like the fourth member down from chief of police. He was the shift commander of the Cape Coral Police Department. Joseph is unable to answer a question directly. When asked if he is a father, he states that's a hard question because he no longer thinks the person who raised him is his father because he has darker hair. We've attempted to look into this, and there's no evidence that the man who raised him isn't his father. When asked where his relatives were living in 1990, he begins to talk about their jobs, and only tells the court, Cape Coral, when prodded by his attorney. He is refusing to be direct, and only answers questions in a roundabout way. This is a telltale sign of someone not being truthful. Think of a time when you ask a question to a child. You ask them if they finished their homework or cleaned their room. And instead of saying yes or no, they begin to tell you how they were in their room, and then they heard a noise, and then they found a toy they had lost a year ago, and the toy was a Power Rangers action figure, and they remembered this really, really great episode of Power Rangers that they saw another year ago, and so on and so forth. They don't want to tell you something that you don't want to hear, so instead, they try and distract you by telling you something else entirely. That's what Joseph is doing, because he's about as smart as a three-year-old. All right, let me ask you a, a couple of questions. Um, where were you born? I was born in a in, uh, little company of Mary Hospital in Evergreen Park, Illinois. How long did you live in Illinois? Uh, 
I lived in Illinois until I was 16, and my parents, I call them my parents because I'm so used to calling that man my, my father, so I will slip up once in a while, but the man I believed was my father at that time forced me to move down here with him and my mother because my mother wanted me to finish high school. Okay, so you and your mother and the person that maybe your father moved to, where, where down here? We moved to Parkwood Estates was our first residence, which is uh, Central Fort Myers by Pagefield. Okay, how long were you in Florida? Um, one second. Um, well, I've on and off, back and forth, so from from Florida to Illinois, you know, so, I mean, at least a half a dozen times. Were you ever a resident of the state of Maryland? Yes, I was. All right, and, and back in 1990, were you uh, registered as a driver in the state of Maryland? Yes, I was. Oh, has your hair ever been light? No, never. Do you know Jan Cornell? No, no, I don't know Jan Cornell. Do you know Lisa Story? No. Do you know Robin Cornell? No. There was another name that was mentioned uh, during um, the questioning, a Leanne Deller? Uh, no, I, all them names I read in my discovery. And that's how I became aware of them names. Okay. Have you, you, you saw photographs of the residence where this event occurred? You've been here during trial, haven't you, Mr. Zeiler? Well, yes, I've been here during trial, but when the, the Cape Coral police interrogated me, they didn't show me the owner of the apartment. Okay. I'm asking you now, have you seen photographs that were admitted into evidence depicting the scene of the event? Yes. Have you ever been in there? No. Now, you made phone calls after you were initially arrested for the event that occurred with Ms. Nisley's son. You made phone calls to her, did you not? Yes, he's my son with her. Um, so it, it, are you the, are you the birth father of that child? Yes. Um, <clears throat> when he was born, Bonnie was still married to her, uh, first husband. So they put his name on the birth certificate, but I agreed to sign the paper to have it removed. Okay. So do you, do you basically raise that child as your own? Yes. The uh, the letter that you wrote to Bonnie that was read in court, you were making reference to somebody who was living in the house and who needed to go on. Who were those references about? That's, that's our son together, Zachary. Okay. At any point in time in the letter, were you making any admissions to having committed this offense? Zachary's offense? No. No, the not, offense for which you're charged in this courtroom. No, not no, not at all. What were you referring to? Um, I was referring to my altercation with my 26 year old drunken son. The uh, you made reference to something that happened in 1990. What was that? I was arrested in July of 1990. Um. Because it was my son's birthday, that's how I remember my oldest, my oldest son, um, Joey's birthday, and I had, I had a pistol on board my sailboat. He was visiting me, and when I went across the street to go do some laundry, I didn't feel comfortable leaving the pistol on the boat with him. I was trying to be responsible, and. Uh, I took the gun with me across the street to do some laundry. And while I was there, I stopped in a jewelry store to try to sell uh, or tr sell 
uh, a couple items so I could buy him a birthday present. Okay. And were you ultimately held responsible for that? Well, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, sir. <clears throat> Well, with, without getting into all the events, is that part of your prior felony conviction? Oh, yes, yes. All right. Back in May of 1990, were there any warrants out for you? Yes, there was There was a warrant out for me in St. Mary County, Maryland, uh, issued 52990. That was... That was the day that I left because they came to my work trying to find me and my boss covered for me. I jumped on my, my motorcycle and I headed here. All right. Was there a warrant for you out of Chicago issued in 1987? Yes. Yes. Did you make reference in either the phone calls or the letter to those warrants? Well, yeah, that's exactly what I was talking about, about the stuff we talked about before. I previously mentioned how when you take the stand in your own defense, you want to come off as innocent. You want to appear forthright, honest, and completely incapable of doing what you're being charged with. And Joseph has managed to do the opposite. His attorney, going through all of his prior warrants and charges, we get the sense that Joseph is not entirely a trustworthy person who was not above breaking the law. In the brief glimpses we get of his prior crimes, from shooting his son with a pellet gun, we know he isn't above harming others, and he's completely alright with running from the law, like what occurred in this case, and he's doing nothing to make any of his actions seem justified. Uh, were, you, were you ever stopped in the state of Florida? Yes, yes, um, probably four or five times all together, but only twice with Bonnie, with me. So she recited that the, uh, the time that you were stopped was much later on uh, in your relationship. Do you recall when the first time you were stopped for well, the yeah, Chicago warrant? The first time we were together when we were stopped <laughs> together was at leaving Heavenly Pizza in North Fort Myers. We were driving um, her Jeep and the police pulled us over and um, they put me in the back of the squad car and held me for close to an hour and a half. Did they release you? Yes, but they told me at any time that the warrant was still active. Did you hear Sustained. Excuse me? What the police said. Sustained. Move on. But, but you were aware that that warrant is still active? Yes. Where were you? Well, let me ask a different question. Um, you heard the, the last state's witness testify with regard to some comments that you made while you were in the custody of the Cape Coral Police Department. Did you hear those? Mm-hmm. Is that a yes? Yes, yes, sorry. Yes. All right, one of those comments was something about the death penalty. Why did you talk to the officer about the death penalty? Well, I was being facetious because I knew that they arrested the wrong person. Where, where were you on May 9th and 10th of 1990? I was in Maryland. And Mr. Zeiler, um, you've heard experts testify in this case that uh, they are convinced that at least one, if not all three, of the sites of uh, uh, semen or of other bodily fluid that were placed on the bed sheet, the pillow, and or the exterior of the young lady's genitalia was your semen. Uh, is that possible? No, it's not. This statement directly goes against his own letter. Again, he claimed he had sex with Jan, and that's how his semen and his hair was found in the home. To quote his letter, being young, on vacation, sleeping with divorced, willing, consensual older women is in no way a crime, unquote. But now, while on the stand, he is claiming he never met her. Uh, Judge, at this time, I have no further questions. Um, Mr. Zeiler may want to address the jury. 
Let's go over the defense briefly here, because it's important. Joseph says he didn't do it, that he was out of state when the crime occurred, and therefore it cannot be him. However, his attorney offers no evidence of this. There are no bank records that place Joseph in Maryland. He doesn't have any records of working in Maryland at the time of the crime, and there's quite literally nothing placing him there. They provide nothing to supplement his statements, and instead, his simple answer is supposed to be enough for the jury in this case. According to Joseph's lawyer, Joseph wanted a moment to address the court himself and give his own perspective as to what happened, which is ridiculous. The lawyer knows this. He doesn't want to ask if it's okay for his client to go on a monologue about his thoughts on the case. But, as we will see, Joseph is incredibly aggressive and entirely unwilling to compromise. It was also theorized by court TV correspondents that Joseph was going to perjure himself while on the stand, and that he wanted his lawyer to ask him specific questions for him to do so, and he would be unable to do that. From whom the letter is coming says Joseph Adam Zeiler at the top, and then it, there's more, but that's the first part. Yes. And what are the numbers 47492 slash 835775? That's my ID number followed by my booking number. At the Lee County Jail? Yes. And the address of 2115 MLK Boulevard, Main Jail, Fort Myers, 33901, that's the, where you're being housed? Yes. And that letter was addressed to who, sir? J.G. Batista and family. At what, well, um, who, do you, did you address this envelope? Yes. And who was J. G. Batista and family. Well, I thought it was Jenny Gal Batista. Oh, so you were trying to send this letter to Robin's sister then? Yes. Okay. No. Yes. Um, I was trying to send it to family, actually. So I guess I was trying to send it to everybody. The whole Batista family? Yes. And in that particular letter, uh, did you uh, profess your innocence by claiming that it was a relative of yours that did this murder? Yes, I was trying to defend myself because no one would listen to me. Sure, it calls for a yes or no. Did you, in the letter, profess your innocence or allege your innocence by saying that a relative of yours had done these murders? Yes. What he just admitted to was horrifying. His DNA was at the scene, not a family member's not an unknown, blonde man, his. And he decided to send a letter to whom he believed was the victim's family, which is obviously disgusting. Did you suggest, in addition to that, no, did you tell the people who this letter's addressed to that you slept with Jan Cornell, Janice, and a friend of hers in 1989, and therefore that's why your DNA is in the courtyard's north condominium. Yes, I, I thought so because she didn't wash her sheets. You know whether or not Miss Cornell washes her sheets? Also, I, how I got that is by the information I was giving, given from you was discovery, and I thought that the only way my DNA could have gotten there was me sleeping with Jan Cornell and Leanne Deller. As a reminder, he said in direct examination that he had never slept with Jan Cornell or Lee Ann Deller. Did you sleep with Jan Cornell and Miss Deller? It's possible because I was here. Well, now you were here. I mean, I was here in December 89. I testified to that earlier. And what I believe happened is I slept with Jan Cornell and Leanne Deller, and they were just too much of a pig not to wash their sheets. He just called the mother of the victim, the woman who discovered the body of her 11-year-old daughter, and performed CPR on her, a pig. Jan had no part in the crime, and had fought for years to keep her daughter's name in the public eye. In her testimony, she broke down discussing finding her daughter and her friend dead, and how she is haunted by that night. She is a victim in this, and he just called her a pig, all while asking the jury to overlook the concrete evidence that he is the killer, and changing his story to state that he was in Florida at the time of the murder, and he somehow believed that he was going to be found innocent.
And during your direct exam by uh, counsel, your attorney, you just you indicate you've never been in their condominium. I'm speculating that the only way my DNA could have got in there is if I slept with them during December 89 while I was here for the month of December. And then it would have to follow that your DNA would have stayed viable for five. The, hold, let me finish my question. For if it was January, February, March, April, May of 1990, and then, well, okay, I don't want to make it a compound question. Your DNA would have still been there five months later. Yes. And that's because they're pigs and they don't wash their sheets, exactly. right? Exactly. You know that? Well, I, I, I assume that, just like you're assuming that I, that... But just so the record's clear, when I said they're pigs and they wash their sheets, that's what you said. Absolutely. All right. And sitting in, in jail, pending charges on this case, uh, you thought that this was appropriate to send the 11-year-old... 11? ...who was no. murdered... It's a mother. Well, nobody would listen to me, so I was trying to defend myself. Can I speak? No, sir. Wait for a question, please. May I retrieve the exhibit? Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Approach with, with uh, Exhibit 312. 312. Take a moment to look at that letter, please. Was the previous exhibit admitted? Move to admit 311 if I didn't. No objection. 311 is admitted. Sir, on the second page, uh, that which shows the envelope which was sent to, again, J.G. Batista, and addressed from Joseph Adams Eiler with the same numbers. Is that also a letter you wrote? I concede I wrote all this. And in this second letter, you uh, you, you told Jan Corn you directed this towards Jan Cornell, correct? And when you said this, I can't and say unless you show me the letter. I am. I want to direct you to the page right now, page three. So it's the the page right after the envelope picture. On the second paragraph, did you address to Jan Cornell the following? The only way, underlined, is to admit you possibly could have slept with me as a night encounter and you can't remember, you won't be sure, you won't retest. Did you? Hold on a second. Okay. Jan Cornell's name above that. Joseph believes that he's besting the lawyer here and that he's coming across completely rationally, which is absurd given what is currently happening. He makes unbroken, aggressive eye contact with opposing counsel, trying to establish dominance. He raises his hand to shush the lawyer when he begins saying things he doesn't like, and he bites back at his statements in an inane, self serving way, all believing that the jury is going to look at his actions and think, Oh yeah, this guy couldn't have done this. He's completely delusional. You said Jan Cornell's name was there. No, I, no, on no, that no. Page. I said, were you? Who were you? I'll ask it this way: Who were you addressing when you made that statement? Did, is there someone else in the Batista family you slept with? Let According the, to you, let the witness answer the question before you ask another question, sir. Yes, Your Honor. Well, uh, yeah, I yes. Yes to what? I don't know. Ask it again. I... All right. What the fuck? I'm going to ask it open-ended. It's fine. Right. It, right? A very open-ended question. When you made that statement in the letter, who were you directing that Jan to? Cornell. I was trying to get her to ask to retest NB32A because it doesn't contain my DNA. It does. And Joseph is not an expert when it comes to DNA. So him attempting to give expert testimony about the subject is moot. I don't believe. I don't believe it is. You've been sitting here for the last two and a half days, right? Pretty much, yeah. Did you hear the testimony of who was it that retested? Which, Jim Pollock. Of Jim Pollock, 
Was it Jim Pollock? It was Jim Pollock. It was no, the, the retest. The retest. That Ordovan, Vicky Molino. All right. All well, the DNA witnesses, did you hear them say that they actually did retest NB32, that they actually took the sheet, recut another sample, and had another analyst do the same test? Did you hear that? Yes. So the retesting was done. I believe FDLE is siding with the prosecution. Of course they're going to say that. So let's go over what he believes happened. He believes he slept with Jan Cornell or her friend in 1989, and she never washed her sheets afterwards. Then, months later, Lisa and Robin were killed by another person, a blonde-haired mystery man who just so happened to have the same DNA as him. Then, for over 20 years, the police pretended to look for the culprit of this crime, but knew it was either his father or his uncle, both of which are pedophiles who had previously worked for the police. They hid this fact for years, and it was only decades later when Joseph's DNA was taken after he shot his son, that they decided to pin the crime on him. So everyone in multiple testing labs, the police, and the prosecution got together to pin the crime on him, for no reason, and all the evidence that makes him look guilty was all planted and fake. That sounds about right. Okay, and their opinion on that was that Jan Cornell was excluded from that DNA. I don't think she was. I think that if it was listed, that's the reason I asked for it to be retested, because I don't believe that. Now, if you flip the page for me and you go to the fourth page of this pack of that exhibit, and I'm going to ask you to look at the bottom. Did you uh, also direct this to Jan Cornell? If you knowingly allow them to convict the wrong man out of spite and vengeance, I will drag this, parentheses, and you, Robin and Lisa, through appeals all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. Absolutely. I wrote that. And did you also write on the next line, I'm innocent, I will prove it, no matter how long it takes, do you really want the rest of your life spent in court? Yes, I wrote that. You're threatening then Miss Cornell with how you're, what you're going to do should she not, what? What do you want her to do? Well, she's calling me a rapist and a murderer, so what, I can't, I can't write that? So, I mean, she's calling on. me a rapist and a murderer, and I'm calling her a pig for not washing her sheets. At what point in the, 20, uh, in the 33 years has Miss Cornell called you anything? What do you mean? At what point well, she... Why am I in court today? You're all trying to, com to convince this jury that I somehow left blonde hair and Lisa Honor, Stewart's mouth and clutch and Robin that. Cornell's fist because Mr. that's uh, a piece of paper right here Mr. that they're trying to hide from you. Mr. Right Siler. Here. I still see the body of 11-year-old Robin Siler. Cornell yeah. with the hand, with the hair of her Let killer. The jury will step out. The blonde Mr. hair... So we're going to stop this here, because that was horrible. Joseph would be admonished by the judge and threatened to be placed in contempt of court. If you are interested in watching the rest of the cross-examination, I will leave a link to it in the description down below. Notably, he would end up flipping off the cameras in court while testifying, as if he couldn't get any worse. Joseph believed he was going to be able to walk away from this case with the jury on his side. He believed that simply by him saying that the evidence was fake, and that all the experts in the case were lying, that he would be able to get away with murder. But that was far from the case. The evidence and his behavior on the stand resulted in an incredibly short deliberation, and Joseph was found guilty on all counts. The jury would recommend the death penalty for Joseph, citing his harassment of the victim's families and his lack of remorse. I don't know how bad you have to fuck this up to where a group of people all kind of sit down and think, you know what, yeah, he needs to, he needs to leave the planet. He's too much of a liability. While awaiting his sentencing, he would attack his own lawyer in the courtroom. According to his attorney, Kevin Shirley, he seemed like he didn't want our conversation to be picked up by the microphones. So he waved me down and I bent over and he struck me. He had also etched the word killer into his veneers, flashing them at the cameras as he waited to hear his sentence. Joseph had been hoping to get a retrial, but after the assault, the judge denied his motion and decided not to overturn his conviction. The judge would then sentence him to death. According to an interview he would do with NBC2, after he was sent to death row, Joseph had etched the words killer into his teeth because he was, quote, playing the role after being convicted. 
He then stated that his attorney had sabotaged him during the trial because he was sleeping with his aunt, and that he would eventually get a new trial and prove his innocence. He was quoted as saying, The conviction's going to be overturned the minute I get post-conviction DNA testing. I'm confident in that. I know where I've been, and I ain't been there. Which is an objectively odd thing to say, when according to his own testimony, he doesn't know where he's been or if he's ever slept with Jan Cornell or not. Joseph is now back in court facing harassment charges, stemming from the multiple letters he sent to Jan Cornell, threatening her not to testify. But regardless of what happens in that case or what Joseph believes, he will never see the light of day again. If you've made it to this portion of the video, thank you for watching. If there is a case you would like to see my brother and I cover, or a story you would like more attention brought to, feel free to email us at dreading.official at gmail.com. With that being said, I hope you have a great day, and remember to stay safe. For 33 years, Jan Cornell has kept this last recording of her daughter Robin's voice. I don't even know where to, to begin. And now, for the first time in 33 years, Cornell says she's at peace. Knowing that Robin and Lisa are going to have justice on the books forever because that's all I could ever make sure happen for them after this. Thank you again to Scentbird for continuing to sponsor my content.